The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. The BVU Beavercast is proudly supported by alum and two-time All-American Monty Murs and High Country Search. Elevate your search at highcountrysearch.com. Welcome to the Lodge. It's time to settle in for the Buena Vista Wrestling Beavercast. Join host Jason Bryant and head wrestling coach Jeff Brees as we talk all things BV wrestling. Now, on to the show. Episode 25 of the BV Wrestling Beavercast. Jason Bryant and Jeff Brees back in the lodge today. And I tell you, Jeff, this time of year, we've got to throw some logs on the fire in the lodge because it's it's getting cold, man. It's 13 degrees here in Minnesota. I can only imagine uh, the chill coming off the lake there in Storm Lake. But, uh, you know, it's that time of year. It's the most wonderful time of the year. It's wrestling season. Absolutely. And just for the record, uh, it's colder where you're at. Uh, my computer says it's 19 degrees. So um, the lake effect is uh, is not too bad today. It's uh, it's nice here in Storm Lake. Yeah, because you've got I, one, I, one lake t- that affects you. We have 10,000 that affect us. <laughs> All I'm saying is I never thought I would say 20 degrees was nice, but it's actually a really nice day here. It's just under 20 degrees. Yes, yeah, so a, a balmy 20 there in Storm Lake. We've got the frontal boundary coming in, this Arctic Clipper and the Siberian Express. Yeah, my other career, <laughs> I, I wanted to be a uh, – imagine like – radio broadcaster meets weatherman like 70s you know not quite ron burgundy and you know anchorman <laughs> style but i don't know i don't know could, could we imagine that in the sport of wrestling uh yeah i, I think that's uh i could actually very much picture that <laughs> brought to you by anyway this is episode 25 of the bv wrestling beaver cast a lot to talk about since we last ran into each other you've had a second trip to Minnesota. You had the BVU open right there in Storm Lake. You had uh, not the the best way to open the season with the uh, Iowa Conference duel against Coe, but come off with a win against St. Olaf. Let's just start right away with uh, with with the the quick and the dirty. A loss, forty two to three to Coe. Uh, if you want to put the the positive spin on it, okay, it was a, a better gap than last year. But looking at these individual matches, there are two matches that I looked at that go okay. Let's compare to last year. Uh, you know, Andrew Nelson's uh, deficit was was significantly less in his match with Ryan Harrington, and our Ernesto Garcia closed the gap considerably with Jan Rosenberg. He got teched last year. This year, thirteen to eight. So, uh, I mean, as what positives can you take away, Coach, from a forty-two to three loss? Well, I mean, the the first positive that we talked to the guys about was we actually had fight this year, where I feel like we did not last year. And you can look at matches and go, ah, guys were getting pinned and guys were getting tech fault. We sent a bunch of freshmen out there against a really good team. And they have some freshmen that are in the lineup, too. It's not like it's exclusively seniors versus freshmen. But we sent a bunch of freshmen out against the number 12 team in the country. And so what we talked to them about after the match was, hey, if you have that much fight to not get pinned, if you've been on your back four or five times in a match and you're not going to get pinned, that shows me you have enough fight to actually get in these matches with these guys. We just got to begin to fight sooner. We got to have a different level of urgency. And and some of it was going back and breaking down things that sometimes you forget that you need to coach as a college coach. You know, things like how to not give up your wrists and how to swivel your hips to get back to your base and and things that we've hit on. But you kind of you kind of expect guys to already know how to do at this level. Um, and if you don't know it well and you wrestle a good team. It, you get exposed. So we got exposed a little bit there, but I also saw the fight. So I said, you know, we can we can fix all of these problems. This is not most of these were things that are very fixable and we can uh, you know, we can close the gap a little bit more the next time we see those guys. We feel like it, you know, with with Ernesto and Andrew um, knowing that they can compete at that level is uh, is a big part of the the problem, not necessarily a problem, but. It's a big part of the equation for them. Um, we've been telling Ernesto that that he can compete with guys that are in the top 10, top 15 in the country for about a year now. Um, and now he actually has some evidence to believe that. He certainly didn't wrestle his best. I don't know that Rosenberg wrestled his best either. Um, but we scored some points. He scored some points. And it boiled down to uh, he got to his offense way before we did. And we didn't find ours until the third period. So maybe we find some offense in the first period. Maybe that can be a different match or look different the next time around. Um, Andrew Nelson's the same way. Needs to find his offense sooner. 
um, and more consistently and attack to actually score, not attack to attack, but attack with the intent that he's actually going to score and believe that he's going to score on guys at that level. He can compete with anyone. He needs to decide that he's going to start winning against some of those guys. What was the le- what is, is there a frustration level with some of these kids? You know, I mean, you're putting a lot of freshmen out there, but you know, as a wrestling mentality, they still don't like to lose. And giving up six bonus victories is, is kind of a hard lesson to learn. What is what were the kids like? You know, the guys that were in this situation last year that that have coming off the mat and was okay. We've seen adversity before versus uh, the first year guys are, are seeing you know college wrestling action for the first time. What is what's the what's the lesson here? And you know, how did they respond? How did the athletes respond here? Uh, I think they responded well. Um, we had guys that were upset. We had some guys that were actually kind of devastated. They'd never been beaten like that, um, or it'd been a really long time since they'd been beaten like that. And so for them, it was kind of an eye opening experience. They, they listened really well for the rest of the week. Um, they were very coachable. Um, and I think there was a lot of, of coaching on our end to make them understand, Hey, this doesn't mean you're a terrible college wrestler. But this is how quickly matches can get away from you. This is how much the little things matter that seem like little boring things when we're talking about them until a guy beats you up with the little boring things over and over again. And then it becomes really important. And that's and I'll talking about those things is how we can close gap on people. It's not saying we're going to necessarily go knock those guys off later in the year. What I am saying is we don't have to get pinned and teched seven out of 10 matches or whatever it was. Um, We have guys that have enough fight and have enough ability that if they make some adjustments, we can get in the fight with a team like that. Now, as a coach, how do you, how do you really go about teaching that to a lot of first year guys that, you know, you said you threw a lot of freshmen in there. I mean, where do you have to go to work as a teacher to make sure that that fight is is basically pointed in the right direction? Be like, okay, like you said earlier, you, you know, you can fight off your back. Okay. Now let's, let's fight for those points. Let's fight on the edge. Let's, Let's not give up these easiest things. Let's let's fight before we can get to that situation. Well, you go about go about it by trying to make those things tangible. Um, I think fight is something that every coach talks about, but sometimes guys don't actually understand what it is, um, and you don't understand what it is until sometimes you are just completely outfought in a match, and then you can take tangible situations like this position on the edge. This is a place where you could have fought harder. And def- and break down what that means, like wizarding this way, turning your hips left, whatever whatever it is that would have given more fight in that situation. You break it down into tangible aspects for them, and then they can start to learn and build off of that. Um, and the other thing we talked to them about was, hey, that that's the worst thing that's going to happen to you in wrestling. So there's no reason to walk out there and be scared anymore. That We experienced what the worst thing that can happen to you is. You got beat up. Someone was better than you. And they proved it in front of people that that's the worst thing that's going to happen to you. Nobody walked away with like anything broken, anything like that. Nobody, uh, nobody had to like figure out what they were going to do with the rest of their life. After that, we got beaten a wrestling match because they were better than us that night. And then we have to go make adjustments. So I think that helped that helped our guys a little bit on Saturday realizing, all right, we've experienced the worst thing that could happen. Now let's go put our full effort into into this being aggressive. Can't can't go the opposite direction for us. Now backing up before we get to the St. Olaf duel hosted the the BVU Open and uh, by the looks of the results, mostly uh, your 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 number two guys, number three guys getting experience. Although some starters did did see some time. What was the mindset here with with how you put guys out in the open in Storm Lake for you know for a, a your home tournament? Well, first of all, before I get into that, there are so many people to thank for the BV Open. Um, Running the BVU Open is a monster. Um, And if we didn't have the volunteers that we have, the people that are paid workers, and it's it's basically an army. There are so many people that help us run that thing. Um, Local schools that help us with mats, people coming in with clocks, the track team helps run tables. And I'm certainly going to forget people because they're literally – Hundreds of people that help us put this thing together, but um, I, I can't thank them enough for allowing us to be able to do that every year um, and making it run smooth. Um, now, as far as what we did with our lineup, we knew we had a a stretch where we had three events in basically ten days, and two of those were dual meets, um, and we had those dual meets a uh, Wednesday, Saturday, so not a ton of time in between them for for our schedule, the way our schedule looks. That's not something that we do on a regular basis. 
Um, so we wanted to give our guys that we thought were going to be our starters uh, as much time as possible to get focused for Co. And uh, and then not already be beat up coming out of the BVU Open. We've we've wrestled uh, some duels my first two years where we've wrestled a bunch of people in the BVU Open, and they were banged up and we couldn't use them next week for the duel, and we really needed them. So we took the approach of we're going to take as many guys out of the lineup for the BVU Open, make sure they're healthy and ready to go for this stretch run against Co and Saint Olaf to finish the semester. And then anybody else that we didn't think was a starter or that was uh, was in need of some matches because they'd been dinged up a little bit earlier in the year, we were going to get them in into the BVU Open. So that was that was pretty much the approach. Um, I thought it worked out really well. We did some different things with bracketing this year, and we had an A and a B division. Um, we put almost all of our guys in the B division um, just so they could see, you know, similar people still see some freshmen. Or see some guys that weren't uh, weren't at you know top five, top ten in the country because we have teams from all divisions at our open. So to go see the number one guy in the country in junior college in your first match, maybe not really the look you need if you're uh, you know four and five at that point in the season as a freshman. So um, we did the A and the B division, and we had some pretty good success in the B division. Thought thought our guys wrestled pretty well, and. Uh, started to have the ability to actually execute some things they've been working on. Um, you know, seeing that they're, they're a little better college wrestler than they actually realize, even though they're getting beat up maybe day after day by a senior in our room. So as a coach, how much does it take for you to kind of swallow your pride and be like, okay, well, you know what, let's do something different. Um, I, I don't know. I guess it gets easier every year, to, but it depends on the situation. You know, we, we want to do well. We want to, to show our alums. We want to show our fans. We want to show everybody at the university the progress we're making. Uh, but sometimes discretion is the better part of valor. And so they probably wouldn't have seen any progress um, if I would have gotten four or five starters hurt at the BVU Open. They don't place there because they're hurt. And then I don't have them for the two duels either, which are – that's where people are going to look the most for your success. We've had success at pretty much every Open tournament we've been at. But people are going to look at our one and one record right now, and they're going to look to our Iowa conference matches and say, hey, how are you doing in conference? Not what did so-and-so do at the Luther Open or the W&J invite. They don't, people aren't going to notice that. They're going to notice what you did in your dual season, and they're going to notice what it looks like at the end of the year at regionals and NCAAs. So knowing that, it was tough for us to, to look at guys and say, hey, you're healthy, but you're going to go have a seat today. Um, but we felt like it was the best thing for the team overall. It was the best thing for our guys in the long run as well. Um, you know, we've, we've had to kind of swallow our pride at the BV open the first two years. We'll, we would wrestle guys that were about to place at the BV open, but they'd be in their sixth, seventh match of the day. They don't need to wrestle that many matches on December 3rd to, to place at something that no one's going to really remember. Um, they'd shown that they had a good day. They'd competed hard and I've, I've yanked guys late in the tournament the last two years. So I said, you know what, we're just going to take the, we're going to take this weekend off with our starters and, uh, you know, try and put our, uh, our guys that are backups in the best position to, to have some success. And I think overall it worked out pretty well. It was, uh, it's something that we'll definitely continue to, to look at each year as we do that. Now, moving forward, with well, actually going back to the co thing, I, we want to talk about the win because we can't can't just just glance over Brad Kirkhoff who uh, you know picked up a seven six win over Cole Erickson. It was the one win against Co uh, going into St. Olaf. Uh, what, what's it a bit? What's Brad been doing here, uh, and and how much has he kind of emerged as a team leader? Um, Brad has always kind of been a team leader. He was a little bit of a team leader last year, even as a freshman. That's weird to say, but when the majority of the things that you do are right. Um, on a routine basis, day in and day out, it's hard to ignore that example. You guys don't necessarily always have to follow it, but it's hard to ignore that example. Uh, you know, he's he's not a perfect kid. Nobody on our team's perfect, but he tries pretty hard to be. Um, and his work ethic, and his diet, and his grades, and just how he goes about his routine, um, it's hard to ignore him. So he. He has become a team leader just by virtue of, of what he does day in and day out. Um, you know, he's trying to work and grow just like a lot of guys. He's got a lot of things he needs to fix before the end of the year. 
and he's got a lot of things that he needs to adjust to moving up a weight class. Um, so he's by no means leaps and bounds ahead of anybody in our room. But at the same time, you see him claw out victories like he did against Co. Because he does everything right all the time, and he believes that he is doing everything right all the time. So to get in an early hole, there was no doubt in his mind he was going to come back in that match. He was going to find a way, and that's what he did. He kept he kept clawing back, calling back, and and won basically won the match on riding time. Not uh, not because he did anything flashy, just he was a little bit grittier that night, and that's because that's what he does day in and day out. Now, moving into the match with St. Olaf uh, up in, actually, in your case, up in Northfield, Minnesota, in my case, about an hour and 10 minutes south. Weather coming in, I I unfortunately would have loved to have been there, but for some reason, when you're married, you know this, sometimes holiday things, when it's not part of your actual 9 to 5 job, or you don't have an actual 9 to 5 job, you do things like this, uh, you get pulled away to Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Now, I will (laughs) say this. That rocked. So uh, in case you're wondering, you ever get a chance to see them live around Christmas, it's it's worth it. So, Jeff, maybe uh, look at your schedule next year, see when they're on tour and be like, um, hmm, let's see if we can find a way to get them on. Um, Maybe you and your wife's schedule. We can work that out. But anyway, it was it was a good time. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to see you guys down in Northfield, which would have been twice in a year, which is uh, which is good things. But a 34 to 15 win over St. Olaf takeaways from that duel you pounded them last year you pound them again this year where's the, where's the confidence where are the differences i mean the score was closer this year than last year but uh, what are the takeaways from this win well first of all they're they're definitely an improved team um you know last year the lopsided score it was due a lot to them having uh, several forfeits i think they forfeited three or four weights to us last year um you know not that we didn't wrestle well against them last year but it's you know it's tough to be in a competitive duel when you're giving up that many weight classes so to start with, they had pretty much a full lineup. They only had the one spot open at 141. Um, you know, they're young like us. They're wrestling a lot of freshmen and sophomores, and uh, and they're scrappy. We've kind of been paying attention as the first semester rolled around, and you know, they don't have great records or anything like that. But but their guys came to fight pretty much every time we'd seen them. They have some tricky things with a couple of guys, so. We knew we really needed to uh, to be ready to go. It wasn't going to be an easy match, um, but we also felt like it was a match that if we wrestled at our best, the majority of our guys could break matches open. Um, and that's, that's pretty much what happened uh, across the board, at least in the lightweights. Um, you know, we were able to get to our offense early. We decided to be the aggressors. Um, and then, you know, just things that, things that we're good at that maybe we haven't put ourselves in those positions against some of the top tier guys uh we just kind of fell right into against them uh and so that that helped us break the match open early you know a few injuries up top for us so we're a little bit thin on the top end so we knew we needed to do a lot of work down low we knew to knew we needed bonus as much as possible um you know we were trying to to not wrestle at 197 we forfeited 197 and that was actually part of the game plan going into the duel because we got a couple guys that are that are banged up, and uh, we had guys there ready to wrestle if need be, but if we didn't have to put them out there, we didn't want to. And so we knew we had to get work done early. Fortunately, we did. I think we got bonus um, at, I think, 25, 33, 41, 57, um, and then a decision at 49, if I remember correctly. So did really good work there, and then... Uh, uh, bump some guys around on the top half to make sure uh, we put ourselves in the best position to win and and uh, you know won uh, I think uh, two of the matches on the top half so while forfeiting a weight so not too bad um, overall good performance but we certainly need to bring our intensity level up as we get into to more conference duels coming right out of the break um, you know every point's going to be crucial against teams like Loris Luther Simpson. Um, And then we go to IAC duels, of course. So at every point, every position, any way we can steal a point is going to matter. And so we're, you know, we're going to have to get better. But it it was nice to see our guys be able to execute, um, in some cases, dominate a little bit and and let them realize that they can do that. You're going to spend a lot of time in vans and, and with these traveling trips and granted you don't have the uh the holiday trip like down to the gator duels like you did last year a good month between competitions 
But uh, you know, when those when those road trips come on, I mean, what what games do the wrestlers play? What games do the coaches play? I'm curious about this trip up to Northfield, and and what goes on in the vans with the BVU wrestling program. So it was one of the rare trips where we did not take a bus. We very rarely take vans. Um, I hate to drive. I consider myself not a good driver. So anytime we can uh, avoid taking vans, we do it. Um, Coach White and uh, and our trainer, Dominic Morales, uh, they did the majority of the driving, uh, actually all of the driving. And uh, I busted out heads up on the way up. Coach White and I were in one van with, with our guys, so we were playing heads up. And uh, then we were also at a whole bunch of riddles that we were busting out on the way home, trying to solve riddles. And then just just talking, you find out a lot about each other when you when you take the trips, especially when we take the vans. It's easy on the bus to uh, to pop your headphones in and, and fall asleep, and, and you don't really have to uh, hang out a whole lot. We usually end up getting a pretty pretty rowdy mafia game going on when we're on the bus trips at some point, but a little bit easier to kind of do your own thing on the bus and the van. Um, you know, we I think our go to is usually heads up, and that's because the the drivers can can kind of interact and play that as well while still uh, making sure they're staying on the road. You know, I've got a, a closet full of games that, uh, you know, I think you all, every marriage you get, you inherit games. I don't know what it is about. Uh, maybe it's just my, my wife's side of the family. We get all sorts of games. I mean, apples dab, all that stuff. I, I'm more of a Yahtzee guy. I'm an Apple guy, although I'm, I'm a really sore loser. I am a really, really sore loser. So trivia games are better <laughs> because there's no element of chance. You either know it or you don't. Um, except for, I don't know, what was that game? Uh, like, I don't know, there was a game that it was like days of the week, and it was like, are you kidding me? But, uh, you know, <laughs> Heads Up's not one I'm familiar with. Explain the premise to me. So Heads Up, it's actually a, a game from Ellen. I think Ellen is the owner. Or she's the she's the person that uh, is promoting it anyway. She comes on the screen when you turn the game on. But it's basically you stick a, a card, in this case a phone. Now you have a phone up to your head. And uh, there's different categories, but there's a word on the phone and all your teammates around you have to give you clues. So the person with the phone on their head can guess the word. Um, And then you either tip the phone up or tip it down if you get it right or get it wrong. You have roughly 30, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, whatever it is to guess as many words as you can. Um, there's a, since it's an app, there's a video component to it. If you want to record the people around you and their faces, um, for, uh, let for the sake of the team. And so nobody has anything that they can, uh, put on, uh, Instagram or Facebook or, uh, anywhere on social media. We don't ever use the camera. The camera is strictly off when we're traveling, but, uh, it's a, it's a good time in the van. You know, there's there's different games that are regionally. I know we played certain things when we were on on, on trips when I was in high school. Anything that the uh, the Iowa wrestlers or the, or the wrestlers from uh, around the western part of the country that you've got on the program have taught you about band trips and bus trips. Now that you you're kind of a Pennsylvania transplant, I, I don't think so. Uh, we've we actually do a lot of similar things. Uh, wrestlers really aren't aren't as different as you would think. We have guys from the West Coast, guys from the East Coast, and Guys from the Midwest, I, I think probably our biggest debate is is over how to describe the event that wrestlers go to when there are multiple teams there, uh, commonly known as a tournament, not a tournament. Um, that's probably our biggest debate. And then, uh, or is it state versus states? Yes, that's a good one too. And then we had a, a pretty rowdy debate in practice the other day over what the difference between a casserole and a hot dish is. So, ooh, ooh, okay, I'm, I'm, uh, we're going to interject here. Let's let's go with that. Go with that. What 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 became the consensus? Well, apparently, if you live in Minnesota, everything but green bean casserole is a hot dish because green bean casserole, I believe, is a southern import. Yeah, so that that's that's where we're at. So we actually. Um, we have nicknamed a couple of our Minnesota guys Hot Dish, and they have Hot Dish Altenberg and Hot Dish Hoffman um, because uh, to them, everything's a hot dish. Well, I think it's in being from Virginia, everything's like a casserole. So uh, I'm going to have to go over to Spring Lake Park High School during a break and have to uh, put a put a, put something up there and be like, OK, Mr. Altenberg, let's let's have a discussion here because uh, not everything is a hot dish. My wife, though, has two. We have tater tot hot dish, which I think is a staple. And then there's what she calls good hot dish, which is like 
it's you just cook some ground beef, throw in some noodles and some veg all, and so it's just like it's like just a it, it's not even a casserole. The only, I mean the only hot dish we make is tater tot hot dish. So I'm gonna have to go with uh, casseroles or things anything you really bake and, and take out that's kind of like a one pot kind of thing. Anyway, that's you know, we're not talking about wrestling here, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just curious on how, you know how our teams interact because you know uh, the mafia thing though is is one thing that seems to be pervasive in every level. I mean, the first time I'd ever heard of it was when uh, I think you know Martin from Flow Wrestling had that massive video on mafia at in Baku at the world championships in 07. I was like, what the heck is mafia? We never played it. We have guys that play it all the time, but it's not the same. If coach white doesn't play, if coach white's not involved, it's, it's just not the same, but he, he's the, uh, he's the instigator of the group. So he will, he will get guys going. And then we have a couple guys that, uh, fancy themselves lawyers one andrew nelson actually plans to be a yeah, lawyer. yeah so so his, so his skills come up we have some other guys that he that should not be allowed to play lawyers. he's like no you can't play <laughs> we have certain guys that uh andrew and coach white and uh and then just whoever they feel like kind of singling out that day but uh there's usually there's a quick vote right away to try and get those guys out of the game the the vast majority of the time trying to get them out depending on what their position is in the game so uh, our mafia games get get pretty rowdy. I te- I tend to just sit back and watch. I'm not much of a mafia player. I just watch uh, watch the guys playing mind games with each other and and see uh, see how much fun they're having together, but also how crazy they can make each other all at the same time. All about building team unity, right? Absolutely. Speaking of team unity, a natural segue there. Uh, when we were at the Augsburg Open talking about the the different mottos and stuff, and I looked around and I noticed that. There were your, the athletes of BV had four different T-shirts that had their different colors. They had different sayings on them. Let's let's explain what those what those what those team mottos are for this year and, and the meaning behind them. Yeah, so we sat down and we tried to come up with some words over the summer that we really felt um, fit our program. And it's not something we're going to use for just this year. Uh, might be the only year we do the T-shirts, so to speak. But um, things that are prevalent in our room and that we feel like is are prevalent to our program and and our success. And so the words on the shirts were one, one shirt is faith. Another says, find your great. Um, another says, don't accept it. And the other says, compete without fear. Uh, and so to, to, to make all of those kind of make sense, cause they're kind of random separately. Um, but starts, everything starts with faith, faith in your teammates, faith in your coaches, faith in the program, faith spiritually. If, if that's something that is important to you, um, it's important to our coaching staff, and if it's important to our guys, we want them to explore that. If it's not, the other faiths that matter, faith with your teammates, faith in your coaching staff, faith in yourself, faith in your training, all of those things. you got to have faith. You can't just have a little bit of trust. You actually have to have kind of a crazy faith to be successful as a wrestler. So faith in, in everything you do. And then find your great is the next step in that. And we want guys, every time they step in the room, every time they go to compete, Every time they try to do anything, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's playing ultimate frisbee, spike ball, mafia, try and find your great. And it doesn't matter if your great means you're a four-time NCAA champion or your great means you crack the lineup as a senior or that you win 10 matches as a senior. Whatever your great is, try and find a new level of great for you every day. If it's getting a takedown on a senior because you haven't scored on them in two months, that's great for you that day. Find that great. And find find a new level every day. Don't be content with where you're at. Um, and then we go on to don't accept it. Don't accept it is something that uh, I basically stole straight off of Coach Papalizio. Um, sitting in the NC State room, hearing him yell that to guys, you got to fight. Don't accept it. Fight back. Fight. And so we kind of took that as our own. Um, you know, don't accept that uh, the people that are at the top of our conference have to be there forever. Don't accept that just because this guy's ranked in the top 10 that he has to beat you. Don't accept that just because you're at 500 right now that that doesn't mean you can't be where you want to be at the end of the year. Don't accept that because you have a C in math right now that you can't get an A. Don't accept because you were a 2.6 student coming out of high school that you can't be a 4.0 student in college. All of those different things. Don't accept it. Don't just say, hey, this is the best I can be. That's unacceptable for us. Don't accept it. Uh, and then the last is if you can do all of those things on a daily basis, what what do you have to be afraid of? Go and compete without fear. And everything you do, compete without fear. 
And so that's kind of uh, what we're building our program around. Um, we just felt like it, it really fit. It took us a couple of years to pinpoint those exact words. Those were things we talked about on a pretty regular basis. But to break it down into a theme and to, to really kind of brand it was something that took us, took us a couple of years. And those are things that uh, we keep, uh, keep pretty prevalent in our guys. Um, they, something along one of those shirts gets mentioned every day. And we thought it was important this year with such a young group to instill that in them. Those are our practice shirts. Somebody's going to have a shirt on that says one of those things absolutely every day in the practice room. Wrapping this episode up, it's episode 25 of the BV Wrestling Beaver Cast. Now, Coach Brees, month off. What are these guys going to do? Uh, I mean, I'm guessing exams have either come and gone. We're right around exam time, or they've already, you know, like I said, come and gone. What's uh, what's the plan now for the guys in terms of uh, their holiday break, and when will they be back on campus preparing for that January 10th duel at home against Loris? Well, they'll be back on campus New Year's Eve, um, kind of backtracking or moving to like current time right now. We're about 20 minutes away from our team Christmas party happening. Um, the team's on their way over to the house. As soon as I get off of here, I need to get done with the podcast and help my wife set up the last last minute things. But um, we're going to do a team Christmas party tonight, hang out together, do a little bit of uh, gift exchange, and then uh, finals kick off tomorrow at 8 a.m., um, finals Monday through Thursday this week. We'll have, uh, have some light workouts this week. Um, all through finals week, we'll stay until Saturday. Um, once Saturday is done, our last workout on Saturday is over. We'll send the guys home until the 31st. We'll hit a workout on the 31st and, uh, and prep to, to get ready for a, a tough Loris team. There's going to be some really, really big matches in there, um, for us individually. And then also for us as a team. So, um, you know, got to give guys a little bit of a break and get them home to see their family. That's extremely important, especially this time of year. Um, everything in me as a coach wants to train all the way through Loris because I want to win that match. Um, but we also know guys need to have some time at home and they need to have some time to to relax and, and you know, be a, a normal college student for a couple of days. And then we're going to get right back after it and uh, have a tough stretch uh, through January. It kicks off with Loris. So. That's that's kind of the game plan. All right, Jeff Brees, appreciate it. Have a happy holiday and a Christmas party. Make sure you enjoy that hot dish, and we'll uh, we'll see you on the flip side as we preview Loris next time. Part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.